Hi, my name is Van Davis and I'm the Associate Vice President for Higher Ed Policy and Research at Blackboard. So we have the opportunity today to talk with three folks who were a part of the negotiated rulemaking a couple of years ago uh, where distance ed authorization uh, was discussed and we want to hear what they experienced then and get some ideas about what may be coming down the pike from Department of Ed now that we know that new regulations are going to come about. So I'm going to ask each of them to uh, introduce themselves and talk a little bit about the role that they played on the Negotiated Rulemaking Committee. Well, I'm Russ Poulin. I'm with WCET and I represented the uh, Distance Education constituency on the Negotiated Rulemaking Committee. I'm Leah Matthews, the Executive Director of the Distance Education Accrediting Commission and I represented accreditation. And I'm Deborah Shui, and I represented the for-profits. So, Russ, why don't you start us out by uh, stepping down memory lane and telling mm -hmm. us a little bit about uh, <laughs> what the experience was being on that negotiated rulemaking committee. Well, I'd be glad to do that. I'll give just a little bit of a very brief history of a very complex topic, and so, We'll start way back in 2010 that the uh, federal government, Department of Education, issued a uh, distance education state authorization regulation that was uh, challenged by some groups. It uh, was found that the department could issue such a regulation by the courts, but that they had not used the proper channels in terms of uh, uh, considering the regulation. And so one of those channels is something called negotiated uh, rulemaking panel, and what that is is that the, the department uh, issued, uh, issues a call for experts from several different fields uh, to talk about and negotiate uh, the regulations. And what happens is, is that in, in we had six different topics, uh, five in addition to the distance and uh, uh, state authorization regulation that we were looking at. And all members, so this was 16 different constituencies, had to agree on all six topics. We were able to agree on four, and actually on the state authorization for distance education regulation. It's fairly embarrassing because there's only a, a small number of people who actually agreed on what was proposed by the Department of Ed. Then what happens is that if there isn't an agreement, that the Department of Education can issue the regulation. Uh, and that was two years ago, and so now the Department is, is it appears is now uh, poised to issue the regulation uh, for comment and once they uh, they work on the comments they can issue the final regulation that goes into law no more process so were any of you surprised to hear last week that it appears that uh, the department is going to be issuing those regulations sooner rather than later <laughs> yes <laughs> so you can respond by saying Surprised and also not surprised. Yeah. Um, <laughs> surprised that two years have gone by, and um, there hasn't been a lot of discussion or dialogue in the department that has been made public about their intentions um, with this regulation, uh, especially as, as contentious as it got during some of the negotiated rulemaking discussions. Um, but uh, not surprised also because I think that the administration sees this as a rule. It wants to promulgate uh, before the administration ends its tenure and um, want to tie up some of the loose ends from the 2010 um, rules. Well, I think that's well stated. I think that's exactly right. I would say I was a little surprised for the first maybe nine months that nothing came out. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, they're, they're not going to do it. And so, but they decided, I think, to tie up loose ends. Mm -hmm. So this sort of answers that question of why now. I'm curious to why do you think it has taken so long? I think that they have been focused on some of the other regulations. Gainful employment has taken up a lot of time. Um, and I think that um, SARA, the State Authorization Reciprocity Network and Commission, has built a lot of momentum and a lot of participation, and that has proven an effective mechanism for state authorization. I would say if there was a positive outcome out of this discussion, you know, it was the platform gave Sarah. So I think this sort of gets us into this next question. Um, we don't know what those regulations are going to be, but I'm going to guess that, that each of you probably have some some good ideas about what that might look like based upon the, the rulemaking process. What do you think we're going to see? 
Well, I can, I can start. Well, there are some uh, good things that came out of negotiated rulemaking, and I think that uh, they'll probably come back with regulations that are fairly close to what we saw in the, uh, uh, in the, in the final proposal that came from them. And so one of the good things that came out of that had to do with uh, uh, recognizing for military students uh, that if they uh, move from state to state that at least there would be a federal sanction. There might still be a state sanction uh, about uh, students moving from state to state, but if we have the federal government getting behind us, maybe we can get the states to start changing some of the regulations about this. That would be great. Uh, let's see, and then the uh, second thing that they that they worked on uh, had to do with uh, what's the other one? Sarah, Sarah, that's right. How can we forget Sarah? <laughs> Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. Uh, so, so they did not endorse Sarah uh, specifically, uh, as a, but they could endorse the idea of reciprocity, that the idea that states could work together in terms of coming up with, with how, what is the process that they would use to uh, do the authorization from state to state. And so uh, that is another thing that, that Unless something very weird happens, we expect that the people in the department will continue to endorse that idea, uh, idea of reciprocity. What else do we think that, that we might be looking at? Um, a topic that came up over and over again was consumer protection and concerns about states not being consistent in practice uh, as it relates to student complaints, as it relates to disclosure requirements about obligations students might have for tuition, uh, refund policies, their understanding about um, where they may be able to take their credential next. So I think that um, this is an area of great interest to the Department of Ed, especially as it relates to financial aid eligibility. We'll probably see some language around uh, consumer protection and student disclosures. I agree, and then there are a couple of other areas that I think ended up being very important um, and pretty hotly discussed. One has to do with the requirement that states actively approve each institution uh, in their state for uh, distance education, and that states would not be allowed to have exemptions. And so uh, this could put institutions in this bind where the state is saying, we don't have an approval process. And the federal government is saying, well, unless you're actively approved by that state, you're ineligible for federal financial aid. So this was a bit of a uh, stock point that we and, had. And part of that, too, is we we're trying to get them to define what actively yes. approved That's right. meant, because there would, they'd have a regulation about authorizing institutions within a state, mm -hmm. and it was a real problem that they never never defined that, and so the states had to keep coming back and saying, well, is this good enough? Is this good enough? <laughs> uh, so, we, so I'm hoping that if they go with that, that they actually have some definition around that. Really good point. And then the, another issue that kept coming up was that if a student was in an in a academic program that could lead to licensure, that the state had to indicate that this academic program would uh, qualify an individual for licensure in that state. And the way it was worded and the way it was happening, simply not the way many, many state licensing boards work. So again, it would have been a bit of a catch-22 where the state licensing boards probably would say, well, we don't approve the program, we approve each individual um, as they come and they bring forth their package, um, but the language was not that. And so if the, if the board did not say that a, a, that program would qualify a person for licensure in that state, then they would be ineligible in that state. Or federal financial aid. That's what I remember. Yeah, and, and it's a real problem because there have been institutions of all types that, that have enrolled students in states where they didn't have the licensure and the student got very, very far along in their program. And so institutions really do need to step up and, and, and look at that. Uh, the problem gets to be that sometimes these boards won't answer <laughs> uh, uh, in, in theory. And so they're, 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 it's a very complicated issue. It's a very complicated uh, issue. And, 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 and as you said, sometimes the uh, regulations are more on the individual than on the institution. So we'll have to figure out how that works. Yeah. I think it's a very important piece that students be fully aware, are they eligible for licensure? Is this program going to get them where they want to go? Right? right. Perfectly right. good question. It was about right. the way that the language was being written to get there. 
Um, and some, some people might even want to go to a different state. Let's say I live in Minnesota, but I really want to live in Florida, and this program is licensable in Florida, but I'm, I don't want to move there until I'm ready to get licensed. Mm-hmm. I'd like to be able to sit in Minnesota and take that program. Yeah, if speaking of the military, you mm-hmm. might know that you want to go back to your home state, but mm-hmm. you're learning in another state. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So I know I didn't uh, approve this question ahead of time, oh. but I want to throw this out here. So since each of you um, played a role on that committee, if you could sit down with the folks over at the department right now, what would you tell them? Well, let me uh, start with that, that, that. Actually, I am one of the few people, probably in distance education, so maybe I wasn't the best representative, who, who actually thinks that uh, having the uh, federal rule whereby that you're tying federal financial aid to an institution actually following state law is not a bad thing. However, what, I, what, what was really weird between the first regulation that came out was, was about two paragraphs, I used to remember how many words it was, it's something like 40 words. And then when we arrived there, that it was uh, 12 or 14 sections and seven pages of regulations. Now, how do we go from 40 words to, uh, to all of this? And so it, it ended up being uh, overly complex. And I think the uh, getting back to the simplicity of making sure that institutions are following the state laws and getting away from trying to do a whole lot about trying to dictate what those state laws are, uh, because now we're getting into the unfunded mandate area, because uh, the states are being asked to do something that wasn't their idea. So your 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 uh, advice would be let's make it simple. Simplify. Simplify. Yes. yes. I would say um, be practical, practical and cognizant of how much distance education is expanding and growing and changing. In just the two years since negotiated rulemaking, we've seen great momentum from online course providers at our institutions. We're seeing badges, we're seeing the employment community start to engage. So whatever language they want to put in effect, I really think has to consider the landscape and uh, perspective changes that might happen in distance education that if this language isn't simple, flexible, it's just not going to endure. For practical reasons. So think carefully about where we're going. And about unintended consequences. And unintended, <laughs> lovely unintended consequences. That's, that's great advice. Uh, so I think for me the consumer protection piece is important, mm-hmm. right? And we do need to take it very seriously. Um, but I think it can be done, again, in a more simplified way and a more straightforward way. Um, and so I, I think let's think practically and simply because that actually is going to be the most useful to the student anyway. The more we can flexify this, mm-hmm. uh, the harder it is for the consumer mm-hmm. to be a good protected. Thank you all very much. Oh, thank you, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.